So for the next two tasks, we had one of the from Caltech about a 40 years to the team and the 60 weeks. Thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me in this lovely workshop and beautiful museum. Um, today I'll talk about uh, 4D super control field theories in different guises with the uh, 60 review. This will be based on two papers, um, Jacques and Craig are present here. Um, and uh, I'll be focused on the second paper mostly, but um, I'm going to try to give more as a story what we were trying to answer as an overall goal and how we are going to continue this and come with more future directions. Um, so the really the main question you want to understand, which we will not be able to get the answer for, is when do two quantum field theories describe the same physics? Because when we're really trying to analyze a theory or construct a theory, what we really want to understand is how are they going to comprise a theory? And we need to know when they're the same and when they're describing different systems, because eventually we want to measure them and understand what will be the one to describe a system that we want to understand. Now, as I was telling you, it is very hard. Um, if we have the same local operator spectrum and all endpoint correlation functions, that would probably take to actually categorize all possible theories. Now, doing that is impossible and definitely not tangible. So let's try to add symmetry with your high energy theorists. The first thing that we will try to analyze is then, can you try to do instead of the full QFDs, but instead uh, go to the, um, the uh, fixed points that we can just consider as CFTs instead by having additional conformal symmetry um, and I try to analyze the CFTs instead. Then what it really boils down to is, can we then distinguish the conformal field theories? So when do then two different CFTs or two same CFTs, and can you really analyze them and define them? So what will then define the CFT data for any given um, CFTs? Well, if they have the same conformal data, this is the two-point function and the three-point correlations, um, we will be able to do them. Now, this is much better question than this one, but nevertheless, it is still not tangible. So that is very difficult to do then instead, it would be really nice if it can com compute some form of invariance to analyze the theories, so we can just look at the invariance and tell, ah, we can tell that these theories are probably the same. Now, that would be really great to have, but we don't know any at the moment. But nevertheless, it would be always great to then come up with some form of minimal set of invariance that can help to distinguish to two different QFTs. Now, it might not be able to uh, understand these as a gen generically overall program, but we might be able to come up with some a minimal set of invariants for a certain restricted type of the um, control field theories. They can tell apart that, ah, these two very different looking theories seemingly are actually dual, so that they are actually describing the same physics, which will be the goal of the today, which is why I'm gonna flash the title once again, it's 4D in different guises. So we're gonna come with 4D SCFTs that seemingly look like very different things, but we're gonna have a 6D reveal, meaning we're going to utilize higher dimensional origins to help to answer these questions and eventually find that when they can be actually describing the same physics. And as the um, title should have given you away, of course, I'm not going to be able to answer that in generic dimensions of control field theories. Instead, I'm going to utilize um, super control field theories today because adding supersymmetry makes things more tangible, first of all. And I'm going to try to utilize actually where we're going to go to is for the n equals two theories. Um, to motivate this, let's try to see where this higher dimensional origin really helped to distinguish some form of 4D super control field theories. And as a high energy theorist, I think it's easy to say our favorite theory is n equals four super young males. That's so nice concise and great. So, and this is of course the first theory that we saw um, some explicit form of duality in the similar form from the high dimension perspective. So while um, a lot of us know that, let's review this and try to utilize this perspective to um, our case of concern. So this is the familiar N equals for super young males Lagrangian. I put it nicely in a way that can see immediately with the uh, um, T with uh, the tau, which is a complexified coupling constant. And you can probably already guess where I'm going. So when we have the theories SU2 and tau and SO3 and minus one over tau, 
are these theories the same? They clearly look very just different naively because they have different vector boson spectrum. But we all learned this in either undergrad or beginning grad classes that they're indeed actually describing the same physics. In fact, one theory is at the weak coupling regime, while the other theory is at strong coupling regime. And this was the form of um, S duality that we learned when we uh, started string theory. Um, and from here, what we first detected was a spectrum of massive W bosons and BPS monopoles are the same, and the inner particle forces are all the same. And we definitely learned that this is not possible to just detect by looking at these so-called maybe invariants in some sense. It's not enough to prove that they are the same, but instead we could use a higher dimensional origin of this coupling constant tau to relate these two, which is perspective of top-down perspectives that give insights via geometrization. I really wanted to flash this slide because that's the purpose of the goal today to answer my question. And also I thought it was perfect because this conference is called Strings and Geometry. So I thought this would be a perfect topic to talk about. Um, so how did we really analyze to answer this? Just to recap how we did this before, we always utilized higher dimensional theory with us compactifying space to get the lower dimensional theory. And how we really see this is a geometric engineering progress. And through this geometric engineering, we detect things that's non-trivial here through the compactifying region. And this is how we incorporated complex coupling tau to answer this type of question. So that in here, what happens is that when you're compactifying on T2, um, we can get the 62 commissure SC of T as parents origin down to 40 subvert young males, and that this SL2Z coupling constant um, self-duality group is encoded as then the, uh, the complex structure moduli here as the geomet geometrization of this explicit uh, SL2Z. In other words, how we're doing that is we answer this protocol by finding a, a, a theory that came from the same theory in 60 that gave rise to this um, two different end of regime of the 4D, and that was the uh, S-duality we found. So utilizing this perspective, now I'm going to tell you which type of 4D N equals to SCFTs I'm going to really utilize today. So I'm going to utilize both geometric engineering perspective. One is from the 62 commissure SCFTs that give rise to so-called class S theories. And the other side will be the one giving rise to 61,0 down to 4D through the T2 compactification. I'm not even going to do anything complicated with the T2. For the purpose of the today, I'm going to keep it smooth T2. Um, then they can give rise to some joint region that can be admitted with the both um, parents as a 60 origins. And this is the region of interest they're going to look into today. So we can really utilize this perspective to compute 4D invariants and this perspective to see but a high dimensional origin can give rise to some um, proof of the isomorphism of these 4D resulting class S theories. Now then first, if I just tell you this, um, you should probably ask them how these are formed. Now, already earlier, my collaborator Craig Glory went through this. So I'm gonna go through this quickly on how we got the class S theory. So what was a class S theory? So I wanna actually remember if you can, of this way of writing. I'm gonna write this notation and stick to it. So this will be the 62,0 super conformal field theory of this type G. Not to be confused with this G, that's the uh, genus of the, um, this punctured Riemann surface. This G will be the genus and the N will be the number of punctures. So that if you see anything like N, that is the number of total puncture of the, um, this uh, Riemann surface that we are using. And sometimes I'm going to use Y, sometimes I'm going to use O, but the anything decoration will be the punctures that we are really using. And these are the puncture data that's going to then span as a co-dimensional to defects of the 62,0 super conformal field theory. And this is the um, what we call the class S theory perspective to give rise to a 4D theory that we're going to utilize. And as I was telling you, I will use another geometric perspective, which will be the 60 reveal side of the talk to get the isomorphisms um, between the two theories. And how you're gonna engineer this is, as I was telling you, a 61 comma zero to 4D, and it goes to, and how you're gonna engineer this is through the atomic classification by Jonathan et al. and many people here. Um, so how you're gonna use that is from that theory, 
through geometric engineering on um, compactified over the elliptically fibered non-compact Columbia threefold that satisfies additional uh, more geometric constraints that's really making insured of unitarity, conformality, supersymmetry algebra, and, um, and in 60, uh, 1 comma 0. And for that, we're going to get the minimal conformal matter, and that can be given rise to this theory. And if I write comma n, that means it's not just necessarily minimal. Um, and it can be further higgs with the uh, nilpotent orbits, like the same things that we did here. And it's the same nilpotent orbits we can utilize. And this theory on its own will be then the world volume theory of an M5 probing C to my gamma. And uh, that will be then further Higgs down to give rise to the Higgs branch of this theory. And this will be down on the smooth T2 to 4dn equals 2 for the purpose today. And these two will then give rise to the theory of this region that you're going to manifestly realize, which will then give you all sorts of geometric toolkits you can utilize to compute physics. So this is a more technical slide I'm going to flash today. This uh, contains all the premise why we can do this. As I was telling you, I'm going to use both perspectives. Why do I actually want to utilize both? The first reason is because I want to really compute this 4D class S theory, and I want to compute all the invariant central charges and many things that I'm actually going to give you the list of what are the things that we think is subset of conventional invariants that matter to us to compute today to determine. Um, and this was the theory that we were going to have. And this is uh, given rise a pair of pants decomposition, and then you can just utilize them together as a three punctured sphere, putting all together so-called tinker toy theories, which will give you rise as a building blocks. I can compute explicitly and um, that can give rise to explicit computations of um, sure index, and many other data that we can have in 4D. And uh, this side is coming from the 61 comma zero perspective. And while 4D is very nice and on its own, we're going to utilize now this perspective to understand how we can prove that these two theories are actually indeed the same from the 61 comma zero perspective. And the core crucial thing that's gonna rely upon for our logic is that their Higgs flow is isomorphic, meaning, if I take the Higgs branch flow here and here of the resulting theories, they're explicitly isomorphic and we can relate it explicitly as an isomorphic theories throughout the full this um, nilpotent Higgsing flow that we can do. So with those premise in mind, we can now actually attack this uh, um, theories and what were the ones that we were going to really compute for the 4D conventional quote unquote invariants. So first of which, the most important thing is central charges or conformal anomalies called A and C that shows up in ST mu nu and or equivalently just a number of vectors and hypers. And also there will be the flavor symmetry group and the flavor central charges. And by the group, I mean the actual group, not just the algebra, the group form. Um, and this Ki is the flavor central charge. And we can compute all of those. And then Coulomb branch operator spectrum, sure index and how little with index. And these are of course not computable by full order, just up to some computable order throwing into computer in the series decomposition. Now, would these invariants really then uniquely identify the theory? I would love to say yes, but of course not. It's not generically going to work. In, however, we know for a fact that in very low ranks, these data or even the subset something like just these uh, subset data suffices to uniquely characterize a theory already. And of course, I'm not gonna end at that. I'll give you the easiest example that we all learned in the beginning of string theory, the minahan nemeshansky theory. So if you have the rank one of n equals to super field theories, and this is the uh, Coulomb branch generators, so we have this, and this is central charge, then we know that this is indeed unique by these nice gentlemen. And this is exactly going to be the EA12 Minahan and Mashansky theory. So that's a very little construction we needed. We just needed this, this, and this, the subset of it. Now, there's a multitude of distinct realizations of this super control field these theories in class S. So, ergo, we can say that they're all isomorphic. And that's what it means by unique. Um, there you go. Now, for higher rank cases, these conventional invariants are not really sufficient, as is demonstrated in these papers. 
so that this is why we really need to use or is really nice to use higher dimensional perspective to recreate some understanding like what we did for the n equals four super young nose. So what are the then uh, 60 perspective that can utilize? Then 60 can come up with more easier conventional invariants, quote unquote, that we can find. The hallmark of 60 is that we can utilize anomaly polynomials and match anomaly flows. And this is the anomaly polynomial. It looks complicated. Don't worry about it. You're not going to actually, I mean, we use this for all the computation purposes. All you really need to remember is that there is such thing and you can compute its coefficients. And we can compute the continuous flavor symmetry group, including the continuous flavor symmetry algebra. Now, however, this is not enough. There is a further thing that we call the discrete flavor symmetry group. What I mean by that is, for example, when we are Higgsing SO and SO type with the 4K in conformal matter, and this is exactly the same type of this identical conformal matter, matter that we talked about earlier as a minimal theory. Um, and if you're Higgsing them by two very even potent orbits of the individual disk, then the two con super controlled field theories that we get in the end will differ by a discrete Z2 symmetry. And thus, that's why we pull that as discrete flavor symmetry group, because the rest will definitely not give you invariance. We can find it explicitly as a counter example here. So we add this on top as the conventional invariance. Another way of saying that is effectively recapped by curve configurations that we can understand and incorporate these things together. Now, here comes the uh, important parts then. Now that we learned all of this, everyone's expert on how to construct these theories, now we can use the 61,0 perspective to an answer when the two 4D class S theories are isomorphic. Now, what are the then pairs of class S theories that we are really considering? We're not gonna consider that looks awfully different or something that we can have some gauge of it. So first of all, the genus of the Riemann surface is going to be the same. The 62 comma zero origin will be the same. And all but two of the N punctures are the same. So N minus two amount of punctures are the same. So these are the pairs of class S theories that we're going to effectively consider. So everyone likes diagrams. I personally think this is easier to understand. So this is how it's gonna look like. We have two that differs and the rest N minus two punctures being identical. And this will be the notation, all the rest here are the same and just differ by O1, O2 and O1 prime, O2 prime. And that was saying the G type as G62 comes the origin is the same. Um, the genus is the same and the uh, number of punctures is the same, but uh, there should be prime here. That's my typo because the two punctures are different. Now that's not good enough. You're gonna put a little more restrictions onto it um, because the pair of theories are evidently not isomorphic if they possess different conventional invariants. That was the whole point why I wanted to even establish some form of conventional invariance to consider in the beginning. So then you're gonna consider the pairs or with the, so that at least a subset of conventional invariants are the same. And these are going to be the ones that we're gonna explain the same pose to be identical. So there were two central charges in string 4D. Um, flavor symmetry algebras on their levels, graded Coulomb branch dimensions, and the Higgs branch dimension. So it's a lot less than what we imposed earlier. And this is on top of this restriction together. So then what this means is that since we're in class S, not some random 4D n equals 2 theory, we know that the uh, complex structure moduli of the puncture Riemann and surface parameterize exactly marginal deformation of the SCFT. So then you're allowed to take a degeneration limit. So you can have it like a tail here with on top of this together, where this is the two punctures that differs by and the rest are just then tails. So then what it really uh, boils down to is, can you show that when these two are in fact isomorphic? Now let's go a little bit further. We know that they can all together to give rise to a regular puncture. So then we can really reduce the th whole question boils down to these two. Can we have this isomorphism and when would that be? And what would, would these be happening? So then we can construct the pairs of these two punctures such that the resulting 4D theories have the same conventional invariance. There's a subset of the conventional invariance that I was telling you here. And this will be imposed there. And what that really boils down to as a restriction is this that it flows down to here and the flavor symmetry of this two and this two 
combined together, I mean, O1 plus O2 and O1 prime plus O2 prime will be still manifestly the same. So the manifest flavor symmetry is conserved. Now, if they do that, oh, when you do them, that you're going to have these all the same. So when you do those pairs of punctures, these will be the same. That's the restriction we imposed thus far. The 4D subset of conventional invariance. Huh? Oh yeah, we already imposed that earlier. The type of SG, the math rec G contains the gauge and that's already identical. Um, right, and these are shown to have the same conventional invariance by our nice collaborators. So, but that's still not enough. It's not sufficient to decide that they're identical. And so we're going to take the 6D rephrase. So we're going to have the T2 compactification. You're talking about this? So, because it's exactly marginal, can think of the gauge coupling being all cylindrically taken apart away. So then you're allowed to take and become separate because it's class S. The gauge coupling is allowed to be taken small. So if you do that. Yes, O102 description pairs. And you can see the catalog of how it acts together and on variety of papers of tinker toy models. No, 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 no. But these two operators, I mean, these two punctures are identical, so we don't really need to worry about it. It doesn't depend on the rest of the circuit. My question was having a normal function versus the non yeah. Continuing. So from here, then we're going to use a 60 perspective. So these two are the then 61 comma zero theories, the same um, G and the same amount of punctures, but just differs by two punctures. And these are the ones that you're seeing from 60. And that's the one that's giving rise to these 40 theories. Now, these two are now taken as the n minus two amount of simple punctures. And these are the ways that we can actually get this 60 perspective down. That's going to give you um, the class S theory that we get. So then when do the interacting sectors of these two 61,0 super control field theories match is the question that we need to answer. Because if we do that, we already know that the uh, Higgs branch uh, are isomorphic so that these two will be always generically isomorphic. So for n large, we know that they are never isomorphic. Why is that? So when you're taking n large, if you notice, just the curve, it looks like it just doesn't match. In fact, if you compute, their anomaly polynomial is explicitly different by the alpha one. So that we know that this doesn't really work when n is large. However, magic happens when your n is kind of small enough. Um, so this is for a particular example that I think is the easiest example to demonstrate. And if you see that, these so are explicitly identical as you can read it up and you can actually compute all of them and try to see that their tensor branch descriptions indeed match. So we can determine that these are indeed isomorphic and you can see that it has a Z2 automorphism and you can, because minus one curves top in the bottom. And this is a Z2 automorphism between two different Higgs inks. So you can take one and second VEV. And because of this Z2 automorphism, these two are having Z2 symmetry, and thus these two are the isomorphic as a source coming from the 61 comma zero from um, the one right before the RG flow. So these two were individually then giving rise to the 4, 4D uh, class S theories, and these are the corresponding punctures that we can have. Um, and let's recall that the Higgs branch flows of 61 comma zero theories and their 4D uh, um, babies are explicitly isomorphic. So then we can prove, we already then proved by having this, that we prove that the, uh, these two 4D class S theories are indeed isomorphic. In fact, I'm gonna flash here that uh, it looks very nice. 
and it really works exhaustively for type E7 and E7 theories. For these are all possible types. So I told you it's a low enough n. And we can do better, and you can show that these methodologies that we have really work for numerous type of ADE theories, and we expect to work more in general class S descriptions. The general metho methodolo methodology is that we have these 4D theories, which have the 6D parents, and that has the uh, torus compactification of individually, which has a 62 commissure with two different um, the Riemann surface that gave rise to is a um, three sphere decomposition, but the same genus and same n, and the same 62, 0 theory. Now, these two are isomorphic through this uh, original thing that was gone down to have the RD flows in two different ways that has a Z2 automorphism between two Higgs inks. And through this, we can have infinitely many pairs of 4D uh, n equals to super conformal field theories with distinct constructions are explicitly shown to describe the same physics. And that's really great story that it's very concrete. You could show it explicitly and prove it. That's a very exciting thing to see the new duality, um, but it's not always possible to have 61 comma zero pairs. The, the x one that you're trying to describe because it's it's right right here. at a level of DPS marker. Can you say anything about the non DPS? Yeah. This is not just about DPS, right? Because this one does not use any index. This one is just generically possible. It's like the same argument as n equals four supporting males, that these were explicitly isomorphic. But the destruction here means the things that you can describe on the DPS process. So the matching that you do. No, no, 60 here that we are matching here. Let's go back here. The curve configuration is explicitly isomorphic. You can check all of that. that means that the tensor branch decomposition is isomorphic. Yeah. So this is not the CPS, it's really the whole theory is isomorphic. It's a proof. Right. So that's great. As I like. Thank you for your question. It really highlights the fact that it's not just VPS, it's working for whole theory to be actually isomorphically to be proven. But unfortunately, we don't really have the 61 comma zero origin always for all the theories. It was the subset that I could have the both origin of 62 comma zero and one comma zero. So here are examples that these two, this is a particular example, there is numerous others. Um, where this O is chosen from these four punctures that's related by the RD flow, you can pick any. Um, and these two seemingly look like uh, the 4D conventional invariants, not just a subset, the original one, including all the shore index, look like it matches up to the computable order. This is the best we could compute using the cluster with Mathematica. It looks like it works. This does not have the 61 comma zero origin, but nevertheless, it poses a question that how do we know, are they actually going to be isomorphic or not? Because it's very believable that, um, or not just believable, it's very expected to have the isomorphic theories beyond the scope of 61 comma zero parents. But using this perspective kind of gave a hint on this Z2 automorphism. So maybe if you're having the pairs to be identical, maybe the hint is to look for a Z2 automorphism between such pairs and just for the level of the theories to find maybe such uh, isomorphic theories as describing the same physics. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to answer any. And for D or for D, okay. And what? Mm -hmm. So Jacques paper with uh, Grant Elliott have these things that they compute for index and even um, Hollywood index and a lot of things match while uh, they are actually different theories if you go further on to analyze the theory. So just looking at the anomaly polynomial and symmetry structure is not good enough. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing we did look at was the global coordinates. 
No, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. It's just that those are very, first of all, hard to do computing as a holistic anything protocol. And the 60 is just, it's a lot easier to work with than 60. And the idea here is that what can we really understand and prove things and more beyond to look for? I think it's good that we learned about the Z2 automorphism. And I think with that idea to add more computation in 4D, I expect to find more theories like that. I uh, just a basic question. So the uh, on the Sixty one on zero side, what role does that play on the class side? Ah, uh, I don't The class has a much larger informal manifold than that. So this is just some more complex dimensional sub modes. Oh, there's a 40 formal manifold. What do you call it? MGM? Hmm. Right? This is some dimensional sub -modes. Well, okay. uh, I was seeing it as a little bit some hot up here is that a sphere of components. No, it's a sphere of N functions. Oh, okay. it's like No, like, let me demonstrate. This was, I went a bit quick. Maybe that was the problem. Can I understand your confusion? I used a, this trick. So from here, oh. it was O, and then I really used the N minus the simple punctures trick. Without that, I cannot construct 61 from as your parents. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it can never be. Well, not even two, not even two. <laughs> right, if there's no more questions, let's thank Monica for the great talk.